Welcome. Um, good morning. My name is Chris Jones. I'm with the uh, University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension, and we are starting with our first Garden and Country Extension webinar of January 2021. Today's speaker is Dr. Gerilyn Sponseller, Sponseller um, and she's going to give us a talk about rabies, a rabies outlook in Arizona 2021. Just to uh, remind any of our new uh, participants today, uh, my Garden and Country Extension Webinar Series is a weekly webinar. Starts uh, Thursdays at 11 here in Arizona. Um, try to keep them at 60 minutes or less. We feature a variety of horticultural and natural resource extension, natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions of, and residential concerns of Gila County, Arizona. Um, if you reside outside of Gila County and any of these presentations are of interest to you, I really appreciate you showing up and participating with us. This is recorded. It will be posted at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube website. Um, so all the webinars I've done are there. You're welcome to watch them. And this will probably get up sometime early next week. And uh, the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Here is our presenter, Dr. Gerilyn Sponsler. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Yeah, um, you're fine. Great. Uh, she is a veterinarian, a master of public health, and a doctor, PhD. She is the senior professional services veterinarian at Bowringer Ingelheim Animal Health USA, Inc. And I think we'll just go ahead and jump right in here. I've put in a webinar evaluation in the chat box. Please look for that and talk to us at then. And, um, and it is Europe. So welcome, Gerilyn. And uh, Thanks, let's Chris. Over I here. appreciate the introduction. And I will just share my screen here. And can everyone see a rabid dog? <laughs> yes. Okay. Or a potentially rabid dog. All right. So thanks for having me today. Um, um, what, one request, Charlie. Oh, yes. Can you put it on full screen? Oh, or, yeah. I think so. It's on full screen for me. Is it not full screen for you? There it is. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So thanks for having me today. Uh, I would uh, welcome your questions. So please feel free to add those as we go along. And I'm very interested in making this as discussion based as possible. So I'd like to start off just talking about the way that rabies figures into our popular culture and sometimes into our imagination. I think everybody has some understanding of what rabies might be, but it's a very complicated disease in some situations. And so even though the name may be familiar, the word may be familiar, sometimes um, we don't know the full scope of what rabies entails. So I bring this up because we've almost all of us read To Kill a Mockingbird sometime in our lives, probably in high school. And if you didn't catch the book, then you can also catch the black and white movie starring Gregory Peck. And and in fact, a rabid dog does figure into uh, this book. So it's something that, you know, is out there. When you think about it, there, there aren't that many diseases that would necessarily be put in as part of novels and screenplays. And yet rabies does seem to show up, not just in To Kill a Mockingbird, but also in this popular favorite, Old Yeller, again, started off as a book, which was a Newbery, um, which was a, a, a Newbery uh, award award winner and then uh, became a Disney movie. So again, it, you know, a lot of uh, the story actually um, figures into, or rabies rather, figures into the story of Old Yeller. And so uh, if you don't have a box of Kleenex ready, I would definitely suggest that. If you haven't caught the movie or the book, it definitely, it definitely can be a tearjerker. So we have some understanding of rabies. We know that it's bad. We know that it's often 
associated with, you know, um, a sad ending, but, but what exactly is it? And so rabies is a virus, number one. It causes uh, a very serious and fatal disease, and it's something that somewhat levels the playing field between animals and people because it's what we call a zoonotic disease, meaning it can be transmitted back and forth between animals and people, and everyone essentially is susceptible. Mammals are susceptible to rabies, and although it might be common in uh, one species more than another, it definitely is a disease that affects lots and lots of different types of animals across the board. And the virus is in saliva, and so that's how it's transmitted between animals or from an animal to a human is through the transmission of saliva, which is typically through a bite wound. So signs of rabies, I've got a whole list of them here, and uh, I won't read them out to you, and we don't need to go into each one uh, individually, but the idea can all be uh, lumped under one category, and I would call that basically acting weird. So if you see an animal that's just not acting the way that you would anticipate or the way that you know that animal should be acting, then that's an indication that something could be wrong. It does doesn't mean for certain that an animal has rabies, but it certainly is something to keep in mind. And so when you think about wild animals, we think about the fact that they should be scared of humans, that they should avoid humans, that they may come out under cover of darkness and, and you know, want to stay in the shadows and not be highly visible. And so if you're seeing an animal out of its typical element, then that's something to consider. On the other hand, if we're talking about our domestic animals, whether those be our dogs or our cats or even uh, any of our livestock, then sometimes it's helpful to know, well, what's normal for that animal? And we think about aggressive behavior being associated with rabies. An animal that's typically very friendly and easy to handle suddenly becomes much more difficult. But you can also see the opposite, where you can see an animal that you would say, oh gosh, that's a really mean dog, and actually suddenly that dog's not acting so mean, and so that constitutes a behavior change that could also be associated with rabies. So I don't want you to pin any specific signs or symptoms to rabies and say that, you know, that's definitely rabies or definitely not rabies. Just be aware that it can present in lots of different ways, but that ultimately rabies does affect the brain. And so you will see changes in how an animal is acting. And I've highlighted these two animals in particular, and this highlights uh, somewhat the geography that we're dealing with today, because I'm speaking to you in Arizona, where the skunk figures prominently into your uh, rabies outlook. And by contrast, I am coming to you from the state of Massachusetts on the other side of the continent, where we see lots of rabies in raccoons. So I won't go a lot into diagnosis or into treatment because by and large, rabies is a fatal disease. And unfortunately, that's true in both animals and people. Rabies can be prevented, but once an animal or a person is infected with rabies to the point that they are showing signs, then typically that is not something that that animal or person is going to recover from. And rabies, with very, very few exceptions, there are people people who have survived, but it's very, very, very uncommon. And so we generally consider rabies to be a fatal disease. So prevention is where we'd really like to focus because obviously we don't want to get to the point where we're actually concerned about the possibility of having rabies. So there's two big ways that I think we can focus on in terms of rabies prevention. And one of those would be to vaccinate dogs and cats. And I focus on dogs and cats because they tend to be our closest companion animals and also because they tend to be predators, then they are typically more involved with biting. However, there are actually rabies vaccines that are approved for multiple species. And so it's not just dogs and cats. You can also vaccinate ferrets and you can also vaccinate cattle and sheep and horses, um, assuming that you're using the appropriate 
um, approved vaccine for those species. But there are basically six different species that do have an approved rabies vaccine. And that would certainly be recommended for all of those different animals. In addition, veterinarians can sometimes choose to vaccinate additional species against rabies, knowing that it won't be something that they can legally provide a certificate for vaccination, but nonetheless hoping that the vaccine will give other animals some protection. So lots of options for rabies vaccines, but particularly focusing on dogs and cats. The other thing to think about with prevention is avoiding contact with wildlife because obviously since we've talked about the fact that rabies can occur in virtually all mammals, it's not reasonable to think that even if we vaccinate all our dogs and cats that we can somehow get rid of rabies since there are all kinds of different animals that can still carry rabies. And certainly vaccinating wildlife is not something that is going to be very reasonable in most situations. So avoid wildlife is going to be a better option. So in terms of vaccinating and in terms of avoiding contact with uh, the different wildlife species, there are also different things that we can focus on. In terms of vaccination in Arizona, it's the law to vaccinate dogs against rabies. Now, I'd also um, like to tell you that uh, vaccination of cats is very, very important and certainly encouraged, but in terms of the law, it does vary by state, and so many states require cat vaccination, but many states do not, and Arizona requires vaccination of dogs, but encourages vaccination of cats. So this graphic, although it's outdated, um, I've kept it in because it still gets the point across that vaccination of cats is very important because they tend to show up in larger, uh, rat, larger numbers of rabies cases compared to dogs. And again, this is an outdated graphic, but this shows up uh, and these numbers have been uh, repeated from year to year to year and are still consistent. Uh, last year, it was about about 250 rabid cats compared to about 50 rabid dogs. And so although the numbers of rabies cases overall are declining, we're still seeing that there are several fold more cats that are positive for rabies every year compared to the number of dogs. And if you think about it, it's probably not that, uh, you know, not that big a stretch. And you can say, well, gosh, yeah, there's probably a reasonable explanation behind that. Cats don't walk on leashes. We have lots of feral cats that are in and out of situations where, you know, they kind of belong to someone, but they kind of don't belong to someone. They generally tend to be more free roaming. They don't stay in fenced yards. And because of their habits, they're certainly able to have lots of interactions with wildlife and therefore probably much more easily able to acquire rabies compared to dogs. So even though it's not the law in Arizona, I would really encourage you to vaccinate your cats as well as your dogs against rabies. So the vaccination is essentially um, a two, a series of two injections. And so what that means is if you are taking your animal, your dog or cat to be vaccinated against rabies for the first time, that vaccine is very effective just in and of itself, but it is only valid for one year. And the idea is that you return for a booster vaccine for your dog or cat one year later. After your animal receives the second vaccine, then the subsequent vaccines would be good for three years at a time. And so it's only the first two vaccines that need to be given together one year apart. And from then on, the boosters can be spread out uh, to, you know, cover, to cover more years that they can be given at a three-year interval rather than annually. So that's the case in Arizona, and that's actually pretty common across the United States. States, there is some variability among states, but for the most part, it's two vaccines a year apart, and then after that, you can spread those out to an every three-year interval, and that's for dogs and cats both. 
So we covered vaccination and we've said, okay, definitely we need to vaccinate our dogs and cats as much as possible. And we can extend that to some of our larger animals as well. But then there's this idea of how do you avoid contact with wildlife? So it might be helpful to think about what kinds of wildlife you might want to avoid. And that can vary depending on where you are in the United States. And so again, I'll call your attention to the Eastern US because I am here in Massachusetts and you can see that the type of rabies that we deal with is almost exclusively uh, the type that affects raccoons. By contrast, you're on the other side of the country and you can see that in Arizona you have lots of skunk rabies and you have lots of fox rabies. And then if you look at the map more closely, you can see that there are these lines or striations all across the continent. And that's to demonstrate that bats are in fact present everywhere, which, you know, makes sense because they don't have to walk around to get places. They can fly. And so they're really not restricted in terms of where their favored geographic region is. Bats cover the entire U.S. and in fact, bat rabies can be found anywhere. So these are what we call the reservoir species. So when you think about a reservoir, you may be thinking about water, that a reservoir of water, it's holding water, it's collecting water, it's keeping water. And in this situation, we're talking about a wildlife reservoir. And when we talk about a wildlife reservoir for rabies, it's essentially the same idea that different types of animals are keeping the rabies virus going within their populations. And for for you in Arizona, these are the three species where we typically are seeing the most rabies occur in your skunk population, your fox population, and of course in the bats. Now, if I was talking in Massachusetts, where I talk to vet students a lot, then we would be having more of a conversation about raccoons, and you simply don't have as many raccoons in Arizona, so it's not that raccoons can't get rabies, it's just that there aren't enough of them that you're seeing the raccoon rabies staying in that population. So it's your skunks and your foxes and your bats. And so here you can look at the number of rabies cases in Arizona over the past decade or so. And you can see that these numbers play out pretty consistently. You can see that there's variation from year to year, but at the same time, you can see that there are always a good number of bats with rabies, a good number of skunks with rabies represented in the blue, and then a few foxes, and then, of course, we have the other category labeled on top. And again, that's to account for all the different mammals that might potentially acquire rabies because there's really no limit to that. So who's in the other category? Well, for you in Arizona, that could potentially be a Cotamundi or that could potentially be a Javelina. And I was talking with Mr. Jones prior to, uh, to this discussion that we're having now, and I was admitting that I actually had to look up what a javelina was because I would have called this a peccary. So it's a pig by any other name, whatever you would like to call this little creature, it's a mammal. And certainly uh, this little mammal is capable, unfortunately, of having rabies. So when you look over the, uh, you know, I've, I've delineated out here very specifically who's had rabies in the animal world in the last two years. And so you can see that in fact, in 2019, you did have a javelina who had rabies. And last year you had just one Cotamundi. So that's not something that's gonna happen routinely. Routinely, you're seeing rabies again in your skunks, and in your bats and in your foxes. So those are the big numbers for rabies in Arizona. And that does play out from year to year. You can see, of course, that the, um, the numbers aren't gonna be exactly the same, but you can see that the trend is pretty consistent.
The other thing I'd like to call your attention to is coming back to your domestic animals and recognizing, again, the trend is playing out that in the last two years, you haven't had any diagnosed cases of rabies in dogs, and yet you've had three cases in cats. And so it's coming back to this idea that although it's not common in any of our domestic species, you are more likely to see rabies in a cat than in a dog. But because our vaccination efforts in this country have been so successful, by and large, we just don't see much rabies in domestic animals at all. And you can see the livestock category I've lumped together because basically there weren't any positive cases. So that includes horses and pigs and goats and cattle and sheep. There just haven't been any positive cases in Arizona in the last two years. So I think this really speaks to vaccination being very, very important in the prevention of rabies and recognizing that that's very doable in domestic animals, less so in wild animals. And so that's the reason for just making sure that you're maintaining a safe distance if you are uh, in close proximity to a wild animal. And then this is just uh, for a little bit of fun to see what's going on locally in your county. You can see these are, these are the numbers within the numbers I just showed you on the previous slide, but you can see that you had three cases in Gila County in 2019 and you just had one case in a bobcat last year. So just showing you that you have gotten on the map that your county is represented and that rabies is alive and well, but it's not in big numbers. and especially especially, thankfully, it's not showing up in your domestic species in this county. And then there's been some talk about when is rabies more prevalent? Does it happen more in the summer or does it happen more in the winter? And I've tried to do a little research on this topic and I have found that there is support for both scenarios. If you look at the number of rabies cases in 2020, you can see that in the uh, winter months and early spring months, the first four months of the year, that was, I counted up 49 cases out of a total of 103. So almost half the cases that year were in those first four months and certainly at least a couple of cold months. So you say, okay, well, that looks like there's, you know, some suggestion that rabies is happening more when it's cold. And there's some thought, there's been some research done, uh, particularly in raccoons, showing that animals, when they den together, when it's cold weather and they all want to keep together and, and, you know, share body heat as mammals do, that then that allows for rabies transmission because they're all close to each other and they're all interacting. And so you're seeing more rabies transmission when it's cold and the animals are sticking together. So that's that's potentially, um, you know, that's potentially something that's going on. On the other hand, it's uh, also potential that people say, well, you know, I see quite a few rabies cases in the summer because that's when it's warmer in the northern hemisphere. And so animals are more active. And so they're interacting and they're out and about and they're getting into trouble and they're having fights. And that's when you're seeing more rabies transmission. And so I can see that that, you know, is a potential as well. And if you look at 2019, you can see that you had, you know, high numbers of cases in August and September, which are arguably your very, very warm months. So I don't know that there's really, um, you know, hard and fast evidence that, you know, really suggests one theory over another. I don't think I would read too much into the seasonality of rabies. I think it's more important just to uh, recognize that rabies is a possibility all the time and to bear in mind that we associate it with changes in behavior. And so if you're seeing an animal that's not acting like you think it should, then that's a reason to consider the possibility possibility of rabies. So in terms of preventing rabies, this came from uh, your Arizona um, Manual for Rabies Control, which I would certainly refer you to if you'd like more information because uh, the state has done a very good job amassing lots of information about rabies and it's freely available to the public. So I don't wanna read this to you. I think the take home message is just to avoid wild animals when possible and to vaccinate your dogs and cats again. 
against rabies. So that seems pretty straightforward, but as we know, life can get complicated, life can get sticky, and things don't always turn out the way that we want them to. And so there's also uh, this little uh, blurb that has been added to that same manual to uh, advise you about what you should do if you are bitten by a wild animal, because unfortunately this does sometimes occur. And so what I would encourage you to do is really, really focus on the first point here, which is to make sure that the bite wound receives first aid. So lots of people um, who have had rabies exposures, what has come forth in terms of uh, figuring out, you know, whether or not they got good care and, you know, what was a consistent finding in terms of, you know, what prevented them from getting rabies or not, is that we don't focus enough on just good old soap and water and making sure that we clean up a wound as much as possible. So I really encourage you that if you're in a situation where this happens, don't underestimate the power of soap and water and making sure that you clean out a wound, because if an animal is rabid, then it's going to be transmitting the virus in the saliva from the bite, and the more you clean that bite wound out, then the less chance there is that that virus is able to enter into the skin. So really, really focus on your first aid. And then of course, there are numerous people that you can contact for advice. And certainly that includes a veterinarian. You can call any veterinarian. It doesn't have to be um, you know, a veterinarian where you've taken a pet of yours too. Uh, veterinarians are public health professionals. And so they will give you rabies advice and uh, you know, direct you to the appropriate people to help you. And so Certainly that's important if you've had a situation where one of your pets has been bitten. If it's you that's been bitten, then definitely seek emergency medical care and don't wait to do that. Make sure that you go to an urgent care or that you go to an emergency room and that you seek good advice and explain your situation so that uh, what happened in the incident can be determined. And then from there, the appropriate people can take the appropriate steps because there may be quarantines involved and there are lots and lots of different scenarios to take into account to make sure that you're taken care of. And so I want to make sure I emphasize this point because I told you earlier that rabies is fatal. And so I don't want you to think that, oh my gosh, that means if I'm, I'm bitten by a rabid animal that, you know, basically that's the end for me because that's certainly not the case. We have tens of thousands of people in the United States every year who are potentially exposed to rabies and they receive injections and then they are fine. Basically the, the post-exposure process prophylaxis, which is a series of injections that are given after you are exposed to rabies, those injections are very, very good at stimulating your immune system and helping you to fight off any potential exposure to rabies. So bear in mind that if you seek medical attention early, rabies is very, 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 um, I shouldn't say treatable, but it's very easy to prevent. And that's the idea is that we prevent it before it actually actually becomes a problem. So don't hesitate to seek care both for your pet and for yourself, depending on what the situation is with a possible exposure. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit specifically about bat rabies because this idea of exposure comes into play because bats are kind of crazy. I mean, they're flying mammals. And when you think about those two words, flying and mammal, you know, they don't usually go together. We think about mammals, you know, doing this with our skunks and our foxes and our raccoons. And then we think about birds flying, but we've got these furry animals that are able to fly around. And so bats are in their own special category. And so it's worth giving them some consideration because we do worry about them. And, you know, to be honest, it's good to worry about them because although it's not common for bats to have rabies, it does happen. And sometimes people don't understand what contact with a bat actually means. So for one thing, people don't always know when they've been bitten by a bat. So you might think that sounds crazy because you're looking at these teeth and you're thinking, well, how could you not know that those bit you? That should be inherently obvious. 
but I'll show you these next series of photos and then it might make more sense. If a dog bites you, you're usually seeing something like this. I mean, bear in mind that this is someone's limb. This is an arm or a leg and I'm not even sure because it's swollen and it's got multiple puncture wounds. So I don't think that's gonna happen without you knowing that it happened. But if you look on the other side and you look at this little bat, again, you have to bear in mind this bat is much smaller than this dog. It's just that it's been blown up. And so you see this picture. This is someone's index finger and it's been blown up to be the size of an arm or a leg. And so you think about, OK, well, look at the crease on your knuckle and then see those two little pinpoint dots. And you can see that somebody, especially me, because I don't have really good eyesight, you can see where you could miss that. I mean, that is not a very big wound, um, even two wounds. They're really pretty small. And you just say, well, you know, somebody could just think that, oh, yeah, you know, that was, you know, just where I, um, you know, poked myself and not realize that that actually came from a bat. So bat bites can be very, very small and therefore sometimes unnoticed. And so that's definitely a consideration with bats. The other consideration with bats is that it doesn't actually have to be a bite. And so that somewhat flies in the face of what I've said earlier. I said, well, you know, rabies is mostly transmitted by bite wounds. And that's definitely true. It's just that that's not 100% of the situation. So bats can expose you by touching your mucous membranes. And so what that means is they can brush your eyes, they can brush your nose, they can brush your lips. And if they have saliva that is contacting those parts of your body, then there have been cases where people have gotten rabies that way and they didn't realize that that was a rabies exposure because they didn't you know, think that that was going to transmit the virus because they were thinking, oh, it has to be a bite, it has to be a bite. So bear in mind, bats don't have to bite. They just have to give you some saliva that is able to touch sensitive parts of of your face in particular where that virus can then gain entrance. The other thing to think about is, uh, you know, bats are pretty special from the standpoint that they fly and they have an ability to sometimes get into people's houses. And sometimes we don't know that bats are there and therefore we don't know about the exposure. And so one particular case is when you're asleep. If you would have a situation, and this may sound crazy to you or it may not, but it definitely happens in real life. Um, I had it happen to a friend of mine. Um, she came into work and she said, oh, I woke up this morning and there was a dead bat in my room. And she said that she threw it in the trash and I made her go home from work and get that bat and submit it for rabies testing because she was asleep with that bat in her room. And so she didn't know if that bat touched her or not. And the bat was not rabid as most bats are not rabid. And so it wasn't a problem. And so nothing bad happened. But you don't want to take that chance because if that bat had had rabies and if it had touched her while she was sleeping, touched her face in particular, then definitely it could have been a rabies exposure and she would have never known it. So keep that in mind that if you're asleep, you could have had contact with a bat and you wouldn't know it. So it's definitely better to be on the safe side. And likewise, this applies to babies and young children, not just that they're sleeping, but they may not be able to verbalize to you. If it's a child who's not able to say a bat touched me or a bat didn't touch me, then if that child's been in the same room with a the bat, then again, you need to assume that that was a rabies exposure because you just don't know. And so that's a situation where you would, again, want to test that bat. And not just children, you can also think about people, um, adults, and, and they could be young or old, either one, but people who don't have all of their mental faculties, if someone's nonverbal, then again, they're not able to tell you if they've potentially had contact with a bat, and so you need to consider that a potential rabies exposure as well. 
And then I told you that I sometimes talk to vet students about rabies. And so I always have to include this category because college students, you never know, depending on, you know, what party you went to uh, over the weekend. And if you woke up in the morning and there was a bat in your room, again, if you, if you were under the influence of alcohol, you just don't know. So these are all situations that you should keep in mind that are not common, but at the same time, they have resulted in rabies cases. And so I think it's just something to tuck away in the back of your mind and just bear in mind that, you know, rabies uh, is fatal. There's no coming back from it. And so just be aware of the possible situation if you come in contact or someone you know comes in contact with a bat. So in the US, that's where rabies comes from, is primarily from bats. And again, it comes down to this idea that we know when we've had contact with a raccoon, with a skunk, or with a fox, but we just don't always know about bats. And there's also the bonus that bats fly around. And so here in New England, lots of us live in old houses, and they have cracks in them, and they have old chimneys, and they have all kinds of uh, little crevices that bats bats like and bats are able to get into houses without people realizing it. And so this is how rabies exposures can occur even without going outside. So just keep in mind that bats are their own little category when it comes to rabies. And if you have any doubts, it's not that you need to have any of this information memorized. It's just that you need to know that there's potentially a problem and then consult someone to give you some good professional medical advice. So this is actually a list just to highlight that in fact, rabies in the United States comes from bats. Rabies is very uncommon in humans in the US. And so this is actually a pretty short list if you think about it. This is literally all the people who have passed away due to rabies in the United States within uh, this time frame that you see. So it doesn't even happen every year. There are some years when we have no no human deaths from rabies. And then there are other years where we may have one or two or even three or four. But you can see by and large, those infections are coming from bats. Or secondly, those infections are coming from people who have been bitten by dogs somewhere else in the world. And then they come back to the United States and they haven't sought the proper treatment. They haven't gotten the injections. And then they get sick in the United States because they got got exposed to dog rabies in a different country. So it's not a very common thing, but again, it's something to keep in mind because uh, there was a case uh, not very long ago where someone had gone to India on a yoga retreat and had been bitten by a puppy and they didn't seek any medical attention and that person came back to the US and then subsequently developed rabies. So it's just something to have on your radar screen that being bitten by an animal is definitely something to be concerned about and something for which you should seek some medical attention and also just some good public health advice. And with that, it's important to just take a moment to talk about how good uh, our public health system has been in the US at getting rabies under control. So, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and certainly we can all uh, see room for improvement in terms of, uh, you know, how uh, the United States is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, we like to make a lot of criticisms about our public health service, but bear in mind, that there are lots and lots of diseases for the public health service to cover. And certainly in the area of rabies, there is a lot to uh, congratulate our public health service on. So when you look at the United States and Canada, you can see that our risk of acquiring rabies as humans is very, very low. Again, due to the fact that we have done a great job of vaccinating our domestic animals, specifically our dogs and cats. And you see that North America stands out. And when you look at South America, Africa, and across Asia, you can see that humans being able to contract rabies in those parts of the world, it's much, much more common. They don't have the same public health infrastructure in place. <laughs> 
And when you look at this map, and then you look at this map laid across the top, this shows you where dog rabies occurs. And again, it's not occurring in North America, it's in South America, Africa, and Asia. And so that's showing you that by and large, although we in the United States are fortunate enough not to get rabies, in other parts of the world, there are lots of human beings who die from rabies every year. And specifically, it's dog rabies because we don't have good vaccination programs for dogs in all of these various countries. And so dogs are transmitting rabies to humans. A lot of them are children because you think children are low to the ground and they have lots of interaction with dogs and cats. And so it's often children who are affected and it's somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people every year are dying from rabies. So it's just a moment to think about the public health service in this country that we've done a really good job with vaccination and that you know as we globalize we are trying to move those rabies prevention programs to other countries and hopefully this map will continue to improve. So if you have other questions that I'm not able to answer for you today, I would definitely direct you to this manual because uh, it's very comprehensive and it includes lots and lots of information that I didn't go into. I don't want to bore you to death right before your lunch hour. So lots of info here. If you want to Google this manual for rabies control, it's readily available and you can see that it's a 2020 edition. So I would definitely direct you here. And otherwise, I am very happy to take your questions and uh, your comments. And I'd just like to open the floor for discussion. Well, thank you very much, Gerilyn. I have certainly learned some new things today. So I appreciate that. Um, we will open this up for questions and answers right now. We had a few comments in the chat box that I'll bring up. I'm gonna go okay. ahead and just bring us up here and um, encourage people to put into their the Q&A and chat any of the questions that they have. But um, Lola Van Pelt offered, there is a resource available for wildlife rabies testing in Arizona. And if there is no human or pet exposure, USDA Wildlife Services will test animals for enhanced rabies surveillance and she gives her contact information. So Lola, I suppose you are a resource here in Arizona dealing with rabies issues. Is that correct? Um, and she also points out that uh, bats are more prevalent in the summer months. So Lola, if there's anything you need to add, I'm gonna go through these questions with, with uh, Gerilyn here. And I also just wanna tell Gerilyn that, um, Gerilyn, that uh, if I can get the uh, link for that Arizona rabies guide, I can make sure that when I post this to my website, I can have that as an attachment and have it available to people look to see. Absolutely. Okay. No problem. Great. And so Rob Pearson asks, how effective is the pre-exposure vaccine? I guess that'd be for Very people. Yep, that's a very good question. So as a veterinarian, I have received that vaccine. I actually received it as a student more than 20 years ago. And so when you ask how effective it is, that's really hard to say because, you know, in order to test vaccine efficacy, that would be saying, you know, you'd have to take volunteers to, you know, get exposed to rabies and then see if, you know, your, your, uh, you know, your vaccine <laughs> prevents you from getting rabies. And as you can imagine, there are not lots of people volunteering for that. I certainly, certainly would not be volunteering for that study. But I take your point. I understand what you're asking. And, you know, as far as we can measure, the vaccines are very effective. And the way that we measure that is through antibody titers. So um, I will admit, I am um, in preparing for this lecture, I realized that I have been remiss and I'm actually overdue to have my titer tested. You're supposed to have it tested every couple of years to see if you still have antibodies circulating to the rabies virus. And I was checked probably five years ago. And so my vaccine at that point was still, I'd still, um, you know, had it back 
back in the 1990s. I've never had any boosters and I have continued to maintain a, an adequate antibody response. So as far as anyone uh, is concerned about me legally, then, you know, they'll say, yes, um, you know, my vaccine, my pre-exposure vaccine is still effective because I'm still demonstrating an antibody titer. But then the question becomes, well, what if I have a really bad rabies exposure? And by really bad, I would mean, what if I, you know, absolutely had an exposure that was definitely a rabbit animal and definitely I had contact with the saliva, then I would still go and seek uh, some post-exposure uh, vaccinations. And because I've been vaccinated prior, um, I've already had three vaccines. And so if I had another exposure now, I would go back and get two more follow-ups, as opposed to if you're someone who's never been vaccinated, then they're going to give you the whole series of vaccines at the time that you report after your bite incident. So I hope that answers your question. In general, yes, the vaccines are very effective um, as measured by an antibody titer. The question is just how big of a risk do you want to take? You know, how much do you trust your vaccine? And if you really think you got exposed to rabies, you know, I would still go follow it up with some boosters. All right, thank you. And just to, to go along with that, um, my colleague Don Gouge did confirm as you were speaking, you still need to get the post exposure shots if exposed, but it's a simpler process. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, start. much simpler to just just go get two than to have to start a whole series, which is four to five, depending on the manufacturer. And the other thing about um, not having been vaccinated ahead of time, if you're going for post exposure prophylaxis, then you have to receive some immunoglobulin because you don't have any antibodies at that point. And so the immunoglobulin is is given based on your body weight. And so they end up turning you into a pincushion for that first visit because <laughs> you've got to have multiple injections to get enough antibodies and they can't put them all in one syringe in one location. So one of my children actually had to have that treatment and you know that was five injections on that very first visit and that you know isn't very much fun. No, no. And so Rob answers back, very helpful answer. So thank you very much. Um, Danny did respond and put the link to the uh, rabies guide that you just mentioned. So oh, great, you. perfect. Yeah, so I, so I went ahead and put that on my computer and that way I have available. So that's Fabulous. done, so thank you. Um, Miriam is asking, which species of bats are more likely to transmit rabies? Are there anything about species? I don't have any good information on bat species. Um, you can look at uh, the table that I referenced for you, which was the CDC's table of all the people who have been, uh, all the fatalities, uh, the human fatalities from rabies that you know they keep a running list of. And so they do try to speciate the bats that were potentially implicated in these fatal rabies cases. Sometimes they're able to tell and sometimes they're not. Um, I don't, I'm not up on which uh, species of bat might be more likely to transmit compared to another. I know there are various different species of bats involved. And part of the problem is, well, it's not a problem. Part of it's a good thing that we don't have very many cases of human rabies. And so there aren't that many cases, fortunately, to have to track down to figure out which bat they came from. And so I don't know how much of that, uh, you know, data would be available because there fortunately aren't that many cases. And I'll add that Danny contributes the largest number of human cases have been due to the silver haired variant. Oh, excellent. Okay. That's good information. Okay. Um, so some things that were interesting to me that I learned is I'd always assumed it was that saliva to, you know, bloodstream as a as a method of transmission but to learn that you can get it via your mucous membranes i guess saliva um that was new to me from from the bats now could it could a human pass it to another human that way 
Yeah, that's a really good question that I get that question a lot. And I always I always try and check just to make sure. And to my knowledge, there has never been human to human transmission documented. And um, that's not to say it couldn't happen. I think the idea is just that, you know, precautions are taken when, um, you know, when, uh, you know, a person becomes symptomatic. And so it's, you know, it hasn't been documented yet, and hopefully won't be. But I don't know that there's any physiological logical reason why it couldn't happen. And the other thing that seemed to come across from your presentation is I was asking one about seasonality of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me that it's interspecies um, transmission, like you say, they're nesting together. And certainly that's the habit of bats, you know, they're all in the same spot. Right. And then it would make sense that summer probably maybe a lot of the bat cases because that's when we have lots of bats they all fly okay. south in the winter right and um and then in the winter in the summer in the winter time when we with the bat come on um our skunks and uh skunks and foxes you know i guess they would be together mm -hmm. right but, yeah but they aren't necessarily yeah. it'd probably just be rare case that like a javelina gets bit or a coyote gets bit and then they pass it that right. way Right. And again, it comes down to how much surveillance is being done. And so the person who mentioned that in the chat, there are different types of rabies testing. So generally, if you're testing a dog or a cat that you think is, um, you know, a potential exposure for a human, then that's a direct fluorescent antibody test that your state lab in Phoenix is running on that brain. And that's a different test from the there's an immunohistochemical stain that's done for surveillance testing, which can be done on roadkill, or as I think was mentioned in the chat, um, saying, you know, if it's a, an animal that's not involved in an exposure, you don't necessarily think it has rabies, you're just checking to kind of keep up on the numbers, then they're doing a different test in, in that situation. And so depending on what testing's done and how far you take it, that, you know, there's another step further to decide to be able to determine what variant of rabies virus was actually causing the infection. Mm. And so that's where you get into a situation where if you have a rabid skunk, was it actually the skunk variant of the rabies virus that killed that skunk? Or was it that, uh, you know, that skunk was bitten by a bat and that skunk actually had uh, the bat variant of the rabies? And so that's, you know, a whole nother level, another level For of sure. complexity, but it is very, very <laughs> Very interesting, yeah. you know, to try and think about. It's just that, um, you know, you can imagine the expense involved and the, you know, the amount of uh, lab testing to be done per patient per case. And so, you know, it's a question of then, do you have enough numbers to actually be able to, you know, to give a fair assessment on these questions because some of them are pretty detailed. Very good. Kathleen Corum has a question. How long does an infected animal, say a bat, live after infected? Yeah, so generally, I mean, it is going to be variable, but you're usually talking about a period of days, um, potentially up to a week or maybe 10 days um, in terms of waiting for a waiting for a, for a wild animal to develop clinical signs and then pass away. That usually happens in a somewhat short period of time. And the reason I say that is because in humans, it can take much, much longer. We're looking at not days but more like weeks, more like months. And there are situations where people have actually taken years to incubate rabies. So the pathogenesis can be very variable. Um, some of it depends on how much rabies virus you're exposed to. That can, you know, uh, be a measure of, you know, how fast or how slow things are going. It also depends on where you're bitten. Um, horses in particular and cows, they tend to be very curious. And so they will sniff things. And so I always ask students, you know, where's a cow or, you know, where is livestock likely to be bitten? And they always say, oh, they get bitten 
bitten on the feet, they get bitten on the hooves. And I say, no, no self-respecting, even rabbit animal is going to try and bite, you know, a hooved animal on its lower leg. It's going to grab where it can get a good bite. And so horses and cows, you know, they're reaching down to sniff. They're asking, you know, why is the skunk out in the middle of the day in the middle of my, my pasture? And so they get bitten on the nose and then the virus is able to transmit very, very quickly through the cribriform plate, it goes right to the brain. So that's going to be, you know, a fast pathogenesis for the virus compared mm. to if it did bite somebody on the foot, it's probably mm. going to take longer. So there is lots of variability, but generally the question would be that animals are usually going to get sick in, you know, the weak range. Okay. And Kathleen followed that up. You have your chat box open. She says, does treatment work whenever no symptoms have shown? So yes. Yeah. And so that's very, that's the very important part um, to, to reiterate that about the post-exposure prophylaxis. If you are bitten by a rabid animal, as long as you are seeking immediate attention, then the post-exposure prophylaxis, it basically always works. Um, it, the, the situations where it looks like it doesn't work are because people are already exhibiting signs. It's where you have the people who, you know, are coming into the emergency room because they were bitten by, you know, a puppy two months ago when they were in India. And now they're coming into the emergency room because they're having difficulty swallowing or they're exhibiting other strange symptoms. They go ahead and get the same post-exposure prophylactic treatment. But at that point, unfortunately, it is much less effective because they are already sick. But if you're not sick, then the medic, then those injections are very, very effective. And you do have a window. It doesn't have to be, you know, even the next day, because I didn't go into um, all the details about quarantine. But generally, if a dog bites someone, the dog's put under a 10 day quarantine. And the purpose for that is to see if that dog was transmitting rabies at the time of the bite. And so you can wait 10 days. And if something goes wrong, with that dog, you can still start the injections 10 days later, and that's still going to be very, very effective, and you're still going to be in good shape. Hmm. Good. There's no reason we shouldn't survive as long as we <laughs> yeah. seek treatment, so that's good to know. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's when you don't, just don't know, like you say, the, right. like, like the bat bites, you just wouldn't know. It could a scratch Absolutely. Them, right? Yeah. yeah, so I hope that's been um, the message that I've given to you today is uh, even if you don't remember all the nuts and bolts, you don't remember, you know, the boring details, you just remember the basics of, you know, the potential exposure that you can have from bats and wild animals and just remember to practice first aid and remember to consult a professional who can give you some good advice. Very good. Um, before we close out here, I was also curious about the cats. Uh, I've, I've had dogs, not a cat person. Uh, I would imagine if you go to the veterinarian, they're going to say, you should have your cat vaccinated for, for, for rabies. <laughs> um, but again, it's not required in the state. I do know we have quite a few feral cats from right. where we live. So um, any, any advice or recommendation you can give about cats and vaccination? I'm sorry, recommendations about? The cats and vaccinating them for, for rabies, I imagine you would say do it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's basically that is that is the recommendation is that you absolutely should do it. Um, so I don't know, um, you know, not being from Arizona, I'm not 100% familiar with how it would work for you. In Massachusetts, it is required, you know, it is state law that that both actually dogs, cats and ferrets are all supposed to be vaccinated in Massachusetts. But it's not a situation where, you know, people are knocking on your door and, you know, asking to see sure. your your certificate certificate of vaccination. They're just encouraging you to do it from a public health standpoint. And so there tend to be quite a few rabies vaccination clinics that are available if you, um, you know, are not wanting to, to have a, you know, um, a one-on-one -on -one appointment and see a veterinarian privately and have, you know, an examination in a more, you know, traditional uh, setting. These clinics tend to be um, something where um, I was showing you something similar for dogs on one of the previous 
obvious slides where people just line up on the sidewalk a lot of times and they're just waiting to receive the rabies vaccination for their pet and receive their certificate and you know it's it's just um, vaccinating as many animals as you can so cats are definitely eligible for those or at least they are for the ones that i've participated in you know people bring cats in a carrier bring cats in a pillowcase you know whatever they need to do and you know there are animal care handlers and veterinarians who can you know um get the get the cat vaccinated and you know just do that bare minimum amount if that's what you're seeking and so if you're thinking about your feral cats where you say gosh i don't have you know lots of money to to put into cats that aren't really mine but they're you know kind of hanging around my area then that's what i would recommend mm -hmm. is that you seek that you know situation where there's um hopefully a low cost vaccine clinic or the other possibility is we um again in massachusetts have quite a few uh spay neuter clinics and those usually include vaccinations as well so those do tend to be buildings you know that you can go to but again they're more um you know on a population medicine scale than on a one-on-one -on -one scale thank you okay so we're up against the hour here um give a applause or a thank you to to Gerilyn, to our presenter <laughs> um, best we can please do look in that chat box i did enter the uh, survey for the evaluation if you go in there it's less than a two minute evaluation just to let us know how it went for you and it's a little bit of information it helps me to uh, evaluate my program so yeah, let me yeah. Sorry, if Chris shares it with me, I'm very interested in your feedback as well, because I usually talk to vet students and veterinarians. So let me know if you liked this or didn't like this. That'd be great. Great. OK, and I got one last slide here to um, let everybody know that if you join us next week, I've got Jan Groth coming back and she's going to give a live demonstration on how to prune shade trees. So if you've seen Jan, you know she's charismatic like Gerilyn and fun to talk with and hear too from. So hope you all can join us next week and we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for much. having me everybody.